Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this program by Radboud Reflex and the Radboud Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Inclusion Office. Uh, my name is Chile Temples. I'm program manager at Radboud Reflex, and um, I was flown in rather last minute, but I will be your moderator for this evening. And tonight we'll be talking about race, discrimination, and structural injustices. Last Thursday, we discussed the Dutch context with anthropologist Philomena Asset, and this evening we'll zoom out, look at the US, at France, and try to reflect upon the very notion of race. And we'll be doing so with American author and cultural critic Thomas Chatterton Williams. He studied philosophy and cultural journalism and is contributing author to the New York Times Magazine and several other journals. In 2019, Williams wrote the memoir Self-Portrait in Black and White, Unlearning Race. And in his book, he reflects on what it means to be called black or assumed to be white. He outlines how he spent his life believing the American dictum that, have, that, that having a black heritage, heritage makes a person fundamentally black. But this understanding radically changed when his daughter was born, for he, he got a blonde-haired white daughter. And this, this event led him to question his earlier health convictions. And he now puts forward that we should let go of racial categories and try to unlearn race. But this is a novel view, yet also a very provocative thesis. And tonight we will be engaging in a conversation with him. For what are we actually talking about when we talk about race? Uh, and in the light of Black Lives Matter movements in the, and the struggle against institutional racism, is this concept not an absolute necessity? And is it even possible to transcend race? Well, those are the kind of questions we'll be talking about tonight. Also joining this conversation is Rona Joalle van Oudhoven. She's a sociologist working at Radboud University, but foremost, she is the new diversity, equity and inclusion strategist at Radboud University. She will also engage in the conversation, shed her light on the work of Williams and reflect on what his work implies, for instance, for the diversity policies at our university. So what does the evening look like? Well, Thomas will first give a brief introduction to his ideas, which is followed by uh, an interview. And after the interview, there's ample room for you from the audience to also ask questions. You can do so, as you know by now, by going to www.menti.com and the code is 4667864. So 4667864. I will try to uh, include some of these questions during the interview, but know that afterwards, after the interview, there's still ample time uh, to address other questions. So I will just try to pick a few uh, that come in. So that being said, um, Thomas, Rona, we're very happy to have you uh, both uh, here with us. And Thomas, I would first like to give you, you the floor to just, well, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, your ideas, and maybe the main thesis of your book. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor to speak with you tonight, and I'm grateful that technology allows us to keep a sense of some normalcy uh, in what have been some, some pretty trying times. Um, last year, before the world locked down, I published Self-Portrait in Black and White. It is my account of growing up in New Jersey, the son of a black father from the segregated South and a white evangelical Christian mother from Southern California. And once I became a father in Paris, transitioning from someone who didn't dare question received thinking about racial categories to someone who no longer felt able to live within them. The book is a narrative and argument driven memoir on racial identity, dealing with my struggle to come to grips with having somehow altered my bloodline, uh, perhaps permanently. The hope is to show how difficult, painful, yet finally liberating it can be to stop resisting the insight that despite its social significance, race is and has always been artificially constructed and biologically meaningless, not strictly physical, but cultural, not fixed, but elastic, capable of subtly and not so subtly evolving over time in relation to where one lives, who one loves, and with whom one joins families. Several months after Self-Portrait was published, uh, the national conversation around racism and race exploded in ways I had not completely foreseen. On the one hand, there is more sustained interest in the subject than there has ever been in my lifetime, and that's unequivocally a very good thing. But on the other hand, 
there is a sense of constraint hovering over it all. There are things you can and cannot say. There's a developing consensus on how to properly think about race and other questions of identity that are shaped by legacies of oppression and privilege. There's more interest and curiosity than there has ever been, yet a climate of censoriousness has also set in. And so over the summer, I joined four other writers to publish a letter on justice and open debate in Harper's Magazine. The letter was a straightforward defense of liberal values of freedom of expression and tolerance for opposing views. About 150 other writers and public thinkers signed it, including J.K. Rowling, Noam Chomsky, Cornel West, Margaret Atwood. To my surprise, it caused an enormous debate in the U.S., France, and many other countries around the world. But I see the questions I explored in Self-Portrait in Black and White and the values I tried to uphold in the Harper's Letter as deeply interrelated. We need the freedom to question received ideas and explore new ones. We don't have all the answers. In this spirit of inquiry, I want to thank you again for uh, having me tonight and to open up the conversation now to the rest of you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I, th I think uh, in your, what I could, I could call opening address, you raised several things, and I think there are many of them we, we would like to touch upon. Um, but maybe uh, the first thing I would like to start out is maybe zoom in on um, a personal level a bit more. So uh, you refer to your book, and I read it this spring, and I was positively enthralled. And I was wondering, maybe you could say a bit more about it, um, why you wrote it, so what triggered it maybe, and is there a specific reason why you wrote it now? Sure. So um, I'm the son of a black father and a white mother, um, and I grew up in the America of the 1980s and 90s, really. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a different country and culture now. But um, at the time of, that I was growing up, um, race was really a kind of a binary thing, especially between black and white. You were either black or you were white. And a drop of black blood, the so-called one drop rule, um, a drop of black blood uh, made a person black. Um, there was not even the option on the on the census to choose more than one box. Uh, you picked a box and, and and you could not stand in two at the same time. That didn't change until the year 2000 um, when I was already in university. So I grew up um, with a white mother, but very much um, in a family um, that defined itself as black. And I defined myself as black. The white kids I knew, they didn't think I was white. And the black kids I knew were used to having all types of uh, physically different looking people within the umbrella of blackness. So it wasn't really an issue for me um, until I was around the age of 30 and I had um, married a blonde, blue-eyed, white French woman um, who it occurred to me actually looked very, um, you know, she was colored in the similar way to my mother, uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed. And it started to dawn on me that um, I might have children who who didn't present themselves physically as very black. Um, and so in 2012, um, the year before my wife and I had our first child, I wrote an op-ed in the New York Times arguing that no matter what, no matter what they look like, uh, my kids would be black because blackness was a, was a, was an, a cultural, it was a cultural affi affiliation. It was a choice. It was um, a source of allegiance. And I really, um, I, 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 prevailed on my wife to agree with me on this, um, even though in France and in much of Europe, you wouldn't have a similar mentality to the American one that's based on the legacy of slavery in the southern portion of the United States. But she, she, she got with it. And um, in 2013, when she gave birth and our daughter was born and I held my daughter and I looked at her, um, I realized that I would probably have to rethink some of my assumptions about the strictly binary nature, the either or nature of, of race and um, her appearance. It wasn't that it, I thought, oh, hey, I have a, a white daughter now. It was that I thought my daughter has thrust the fiction of race before me in a way that I had never really stopped to think about in my own life. Uh, if I can have a daughter that looks like this, what does it mean for me to be black? And if she can look like this and be um, one quarter West African descended, um, what does it mean to call somebody white? And, and, and are we 
would we be better off if we could somehow move beyond these categories that don't con that don't adequately capture us or, or anyone else for that matter? And so I began in 2013 to write about this experience of having a child that defied my preconceptions of race. And as I was writing it, and I was researching it more and more, it became less a an inquiry into the mysteries of race, and it became more and more of an argument against race. And I became more and more convinced that racism is very real in our societies, and people are considered to be black or considered to be Arab or Latino or whatever you, whatever the other is in the society, but that we're never going to transcend the racism that exists so long as we hold on to and reify the abstract categories that, that contribute to the racism, that the racism feeds on. So this 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 event shook your your pre-existing conceptions of of race. You would argue then. That's if right. I understand you correctly. That's yeah, right. yeah. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I also want to draw Rona into the conversation, uh, if that's possible. And I have to look at our director. I think. Ah, kijk, this is better. Yes. Hello, Rona. Hello, <laughs> Good to Ted. have you here. Um, you so you've you've heard all this. So uh, I I thought it was I thought it would be worthwhile um, to already start the conversation with just th with the three of us. Um, so, Rona, you you've you unlike me, you have just read the book. Uh, I was wondering what the first thing was that came to your mind. I, I think first, wow. Um, you know, I, let, let me introduce myself. I, Thomas, we were introduced earlier, but I also think for the audience. So I'm Rona Joada van Oudenhoven. I am the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Strategist at Rydbard University. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Thomas and Ty. Thank you for engaging me in this courageous conversation. I think we need a lot more of this. Um, Thomas, when you spoke, you, you, you used words like freedom to have opposing ideas and the need for curiosity. And I think that's exactly what this conversation is about. I, I respect the brave stance that you took in your book, in Self-Portrait of Black and White, which I have here. And um, I have a number of questions prepared as well, um, as Ty mentioned, but I think I will go with the flow. One of the things you said, um, Thomas, was the notion of, of ticking the black box. And um, when I read your description of Beatrice, for example, that she and, 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 uh, and I have it here, you said that she taught you that identities are complex and even paradoxical things. And I quote, um, Beatrice cultivate, was, cultiv was cultivated worldly, transparently honest and full of self-respect. She evinced that cosmopolitan pan-African consciousness I had not previously experienced, quoting the roots and black star lyrics whipping up extraordinary feasts of jollof rice and fried plantains, and casually referencing Chinua Achebe, she understood her blackness as a broad social, cultural, and political construct, and she embraced it, cherishing and embellishing the connections and collective riches it engendered. And myself being Caribbean, I think if I have to identify, in many ways I identify with those sociocultural elements of an identity versus a sense of colorism. And I think then you spoke later on in the pages, um, of what marriage between the both of you would mean. Um, I imagined that we would marry and have children who would inherit an enormous amount of ethnic diversity. But here, and here it is, inexorably have to mark or tick the black box on any census or application. And I think, Thomas, if I'm correct, this is what you're trying to say we should stop. We should stop buying into a superimposed marker or identifier notion of race that is a social construct that we have been made to grow into as a definition of what we are called and that we call our identity. Is that true? That's, thank you for th those are passages I haven't. Um, uh, <laughs> those are not always read back in these conversations. Those those patches, passages about my college um, girlfriend. Uh, thank you for reminding me of those. Um, Yes, what I'm saying is that she had a kind of relationship to a blackness that is cultural and I think is meaningful um, that I don't think uh, needs to be discarded and I wouldn't advocate to, to, to be discarded, um, but I don't think it has to do with this idea that people are, are boxable or um, can be made into abstract uh, color categories. Um, and the reason why I think that 
the one is okay and the, the other is kind of nefarious is because these categories come out of a fundamental collision between Europe and Africa that resulted in um, slavery in the New World. And these categories are not much older than that interaction and cannot really be salvaged from the kind of hierarchies that they necessarily impose. Now that we have the scientific sophistication to know that these biological differences are not meaningful and that there's more diversity, say, within the African population than between the African population and the European population, um, I think we really need to rethink what it is we're holding on to uh, with these boxes. Um, Oftentimes in America, and I, and I do speak more from an American perspective than, than a European perspective, but oftentimes in America, many of the things that we think we're talking about when we're talking about race are actually things that might be uh, more adequately addressed if we were to talk about class or other, ca or other ways of, of understanding society. Race becomes a kind of uh, veneer to camouflage um, other things that might be going on. But holding on to race is holding on to a kind of logic of the plantation and, a, and of a domination of white over black. Um, and no matter how much there's an argument to say that we have to respect differences, that uh, we have to tolerate differences, believing in differences that are not even real necessarily implies a kind of uh, superiority and inferiority. And I don't believe that that can be reformed. Should, should I continue? Should yeah, I continue sure. With that? Yeah. So yeah. at the start of at the start of your book, um, you it's interesting because you started with two um, really um, profound great quotes. One of them by Ralph Ellison, and it is, "Why waste time creating a conscience for something that doesn't exist? For you see, blood and skin do not think." And then I will then I will move to your reaction upon holding your newborn. And this was, in fact, a very much a conscience call because you said, what have I done? And the conflict right there. there, yeah, right there, the conflict there was evident very early in the pages, the, id, the ego, the superego, what loggerheads. And, and you, you took us through that conflict in the pages. And, and you know, I, I really appreciate the, the, the way you write as well. Um, so your conflict is shared very early. Now, now, we know that the notion of self is rooted in one's constant negotiation with a mirrored self dictated by societal identifiers, and it's a continual process. For example, even in the name that you chose, you, may, you, you were thinking, okay, should I name my daughter Jemima or Shaniqua? Um, mm -hmm. But then you chose Marlowe. And I think your wife's response was interesting because she commented, and I think this recognizes that how society would treat a name even, right? And she said it's manipulative to the point of responsibility. So how successful do you think, knowing this, um, that... You will, that you will be in your choice to declare yourself, as you did on, on page 159, as an ex-black man, in light of the fact that much of who we are and what we are is determined by societal structures that we spend our lifetime trying to free from and, and dismantle. And before I let you answer, I'll also bring in your reference to Dubois and the double consciousness in terms of the concept of self, where we always tend to view ourselves at one level, but then at another level, through the eyes, for example, if we take North American culture, to the eyes of whites, in turn, measuring oneself by means of a nation that looks back in contempt. And we only have to say the words George Floyd to know that this is not historic, that this is quite contemporary, and this is a reality now. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, the scene early on when I say, what have I done, um, uh, that's a way of trying to evoke a sense of, of guilt and, and a kind of, um, I think, a, a sense of disloyalty that you can feel. Um, yeah, that you can feel, I think, it, I've noticed this in conversations with some of my friends who are Jewish, that you can feel when you've changed um, the identity of your children away from the group that had suffered oppression. Um, mm -hmm. There's a kind of fear that your children won't be able to relate to the oppression, which uh, is meaningful because there was a lot of sacrifice going into getting you to even be in a better situation. And so that, that, that was something that I wanted to make sure that I understood that I'm connected to an ancestry that had an experience and I don't want to just have an easier life and forget that. 
Um, and as the book goes on and I talk with different people, I, become, I begin to question some of the assumptions of what an allegiance to guilt means and, and other ways of being um, of valuing and, 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 and paying tribute to, 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 to past um, suffering. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, that you raised, which is very important, is the fact that your identity is never just what you um, say in a vacuum. Your identity is always and necessarily a negotiation between how you see yourself, uh, what you see when you look at in the mirror, and what society, institutions, other people uh, reflect back to you and are willing to um, accept as well. And so I, I write about when I first moved to France being very shocked by the experience of being interpreted as an Arab um, and sometimes being spoken to in Arabic and being asked why I didn't speak my own language and, and realizing that my own identity, how I saw myself, was not necessarily what French society recognized and reflected back. And so race is also locally constructed and, and there's all these kind of um, other dimensions that go into who you are that can, you know, destabilize your sense of self. Uh, so so I'm, I'm very alive to how um, also just being mixed and being somewhat ambiguous allows for a kind of instability that people that are rendered just black or just white uh, in society may not, may not necessarily experience. So that brings me to my further point, which I think is very important to emphasize up front. I'm not arguing for just for black people to to question race and to kind of stop being black. I don't think that that's possible and I don't think that that's fair. I think that the book is really an argument that white people need to first come to grips with how they are racialized in society to understand that it's not everybody else who is raced and that whiteness is this kind of neutrality from which everything else is a deviation, but to understand that their race is made um, and is not biologically meaningful and that if we want to transcend racism, white people actually are going to really have to be skeptical about race and ultimately reject their own whiteness. So so those things are all in play together. And, I, and, I, and, and it's not just a kind of critique of blackness or a plea against um, racialized people, minorities, um, going about talking about um, their identities that 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 wouldn't be effective, and it's also not. I don't think that that would be a fair argument to make. I was wondering, and I think it might be good to draw upon that a bit more. Uh, when we talk about the notion of race, you earlier mentioned that it's it's differently constructed in different nations and different regions. Um, can you say a bit more about? how the perspective in the U.S., for instance, differs from the one in France, as you as yeah. you experience both? Yeah, so America is really governed by um, the law of hypo-descent, what it was called in the South in slaveholding states, and which is, which is this logic of the one-drop rule, that even in a person who visibly presents as white, if there's any African ancestry that can be found or proved, that person can be enslaved. This has to do with property inheritance, and it has to do with, um, you know, the idea that white is free and black is unfree enslaved. And so, and so there's a kind of, there was an obsession in America with, with not being black. And there were cases of people, not like my children, who would be a quarter black, but people who would be one thirty-second black who went to court to try to argue that they should be treated as whites and were in fact stripped of any claim to whiteness and rendered black. It's not done that way everywhere even that has had slavery. In Brazil, for example, a drop of white blood makes a person not, not black. So you have instances like the soccer superstar Neymar being asked if he ever suffered racism on the field and him saying, no, of course I never suffered racism. It's not like I'm black. Uh, my father's black, but I'm not black. And you know, to American eyes, he's more black looking than I am, certainly darker skin, curly hair. But in, in his Brazilian framework, that's not what blackness means. In France, where there was never, uh, there was certainly slavery outside of the country abroad, but there was never slavery within the borders of France. There's not this kind of hypervigilance about the borders of whiteness, the purity of whiteness. And so you've always had, you know, some mixed people. You've had Alexandre Dumas 
uh, the, the acclaimed author who was known to have black ancestry, but that didn't define his entire identity in the society. And even when I was, before I had children, when I was living in France, people would ask me, French people would just simply not share the same assumptions that I brought to the matter. So when I would tell, they would ask me, what am I? I would say I'm black. And they would say, but why, but you're clearly, you're mixed. So why do you define yourself um, only by one side of your family? And it was, it was an interesting exercise to explain the American logic to people that um, simply didn't start from assuming it to be correct. And so I found in these conversations with French people, even when I was just negotiating my own identity, I found it increasingly absurd to try to make the case for the slaveholders' way of viewing me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think it does. <laughs> yeah. So, um, to, to follow up on that, maybe a question. There are several questions already coming in from the audience, so I think it might be good to just pick one of them. And one of the people uh, asked, so, okay, if we try to move towards a position of seeing no difference, um, is that the same as doing away with the notion of color? So I do think, you know, it was James Baldwin who, who, who posed this kind of thought experiment, but he said, you know, we should try to envision a world in which the, the pigmentation, the melanin in your skin is, it, it, is there. We see it, it you know, it, it's a fact, it's a physical fact, but it is no more socially meaningful than the melanin in your irises that colors your eyes or in your hair that, that determines whether you're a brunette, blonde or redhead. Um, we, should, we should not be blind to differences. People will always look different from each other. Um, but we should really, I think, seriously be skeptical about the kinds of uh, conclusions we seek to draw based on superficial, literally skin deep uh, differences, especially now that we live in, uh, you know, these, these, these kinds of ways of looking that are wired into our brain of making assumptions based on, uh, you know, on, on quick scans of people's, um, um, of people's looks, you know, these, these were, our brains were wired to make these assumptions when we lived in much smaller, more homogenous societies. We now live in very, very uh, multi-ethnic, hyper-advanced uh, societies where we are in cities with millions of people. And the idea that just looking at somebody and making a judgment about who they are based on physical characteristics doesn't suit the way we live now. And so I really do think that we have to all kind of struggle against this tendency inside of ourselves um, to use color as a kind of way of um, discerning allegiances, coalitions, um, class, uh, ideas about class, ideas about um, religion, ideas about uh, secular values. I mean, we have to really radically rethink the way that we allow ourselves to be governed by um, very, very quick stereotyping mechanisms that operate within us. Mm. So there's a question that follows up directly on this answer, I think. Uh, a person asks, so with globalization and the upcoming super diverse cities uh, showing the diversity among and within groups, uh, in what way do you think, Thomas, uh, do you think this influences uh, the learning or unlearning of race? It, that's an interesting question because you can see that... Um in Europe, for example, where there's been, you know, in recent years, there's been um, a kind of far right populism and a xenophobia that has targeted refugees and immigrants and migrants. Um, the places that have exhibited some of the strongest uh, anti immigrant sentiments are the places with the fewest um, non white immigrants in the population. So places like Hungary, places like Poland, Slovenia. These are places that had some of the, the strongest reactions against the presence of African and Arab uh, migrants. The places that seem to do better um, are places that are already more multicultural. And so my, my feeling is that um, the more that we're exposed to each other and the more that we live with each other, and I think crucially what the point I try to make in the book, the more that we have opportunities to encounter each other on equal terms, I do think that the more um, we'll be able to transcend some of this uh, othering of people who look different. Uh, now, that's not going to be a cure, as we can see that there's still plenty of racism 
um, in societies like in, in, in the UK and the United States that are highly mixed. But I do think that um, there's something there's something about exposure and exposure um, that that transcends the stereotype that that makes me hopeful. Mm. What I was wondering, and you referred to this earlier, um, is the concept of race, and you numerously uh, numerous times you pointed out it was unscientific. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we could try, dive into that a little bit more, so maybe just for those of us who do not know, why is it unscientific? And if so, why do, you, why do so many people still, still cling to it, both on the left and on the right? Sure. Well, it's, it's just, you know, for decades now, no serious mainstream scientist has, has claimed that, you know, race as it's, as it's popularly conceived is scientifically meaningful, that there are stable monolithic white populations, stable monolithic black populations, Asian populations, etc. cetera. Um, there is extraordinary uh, diversity within and, and uh, among groups um, so-called white and so-called black. Um, and oftentimes that, that variance uh, can be more meaningful within the group than between the groups. Um, on a biological level, there's just not enough difference um, among any groups, any population groups, uh, to have developed to the point of, of, of what scientists would, would would define as separate races. There's there certainly is um, ancestry, and geneticists will say that you know race is kind of misleading, but it, it can be scientifically meaningful to talk about ancestry pools. Um, but you cannot meet somebody on the street, uh, look at their physical characteristics, or even know where they come from, and deduce on a genetic level anything that would be scientifically meaningful about them. You can't even say that, well, black people get certain diseases and white people don't. You, like In America, it's typical to say sickle cell anemia is a black disease because it happens far more frequently in the population that's defined as African-American than in the white population. But in fact, uh, research shows that sickle cell anemia is present in Greeks and other people that live um, in places where malaria is a threat. So it's not a racial difference, it's a population group difference. Um, and oftentimes our thinking that becomes racialized really on, on when you peel back the rhetoric, it actually, it's, it's based on something else. In a society like America, it's ridiculous to talk about um, separate population groups in a meaningful way because the average black American is 80% West African descended. And through the miscegenation that happened, uh, usually forcibly under slavery, um, is 20% uh, Northern European, usually white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Um, there are millions of Americans walking around who believe themselves to be white, but contain enough African uh, DNA within them to have been enslaved um, in, in certain Southern states prior to the Civil War. Um, usually this is the case of somebody having in the past um, passed out of blackness into whiteness and not um, not told their descendants that there was black ancestry. There are millions of white Americans with um, significant um, amounts of invisible so-called black DNA in them. So my point is that um, what we think of as, as race and what we assume to have a biological component to it oftentimes um, whenever you try to figure out what it is that makes somebody black or makes somebody white, when you try to isolate that thing and, and talk about it meaningfully, it falls apart. Mm. So I think, I think that's, that's indeed one part of the question. So it could fall apart, yet many of us still cling to it. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, but race and especially whiteness has been a very... Um, kind of slippery term and category. Over the past 100 years in America, um, whiteness expanded. Who was let into the umbrella of whiteness changed dramatically. In the early 1900s, Italians, Jews, Irish were considered not exactly white. Uh, whiteness was Northern European, Protestant, Anglo-Saxon. That was um, considered a superior European race to the Mediterranean races. And Jews were considered something apart. And it wasn't until the 1950s or 60s um, that some of these so-called ethnic white groups became to kind, came to kind of um, 
be, be caught up under the, the larger idea of monolithic whiteness that makes uh, an Albanian, a German, an Ashkenazi Jew, a Sicilian, a Dutch, a Swedish, all somehow have what is understood to be a, a shared white experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's worth reflecting on, on the kind of attitudes that prevailed in Europe uh, between um, the British and the Italians uh, quite recently, in fact. Mm. Yeah. Um, one of the other things, and I'm moving on now a bit, I think. Um, I think in one of your articles, and maybe partially in the book, but also in the articles, um, you hint at the idea that the notion of a race is fur- leading to further polarization in society. Please correct me if I'm misphrasing you, but if that's the case, can you give an example of this? Oh, well, I think, you know, when, 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 when any group emphasizes its racial difference, for whatever the mm-hmm. reason, it, it can have the effect of inspiring other groups to have intensified um, feelings about their own racial identity. So identity politics or this kind of um, this kind of emphasis on what differentiates us um, is a sword that anyone can pick up and use. And it can be used for noble purposes, but it can also be used for um, really nefarious purposes. So the more that um, groups have group racial interests, um, the more that other groups have to start um, contemplating and taking seriously and advocating for their own interests. So I think the, 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 the thing that we have to keep our, our eye on is that if we actually want to get to a world where um, we don't have white people running around advocating for white interests, then we actually have to get to a world where um, we kind of operate on a universal plane. There are universal values and universal interests, and, and, and maybe we're going to have to pay more attention to class differences and class interests. But so long as there are, you know, we're creating a world in which every single group advocates for their interests except for except for for whites and you can see that there's an extraordinary backlash happening in society i don't say that to say that we should placate white racists i say that just Mm -hmm. the fact is that there is an extraordinary backlash um happening and it's fueled some horrific developments in our politics in america in brazil in the united kingdom you name it when 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 there when there's rising ethnic tensions that necessarily um has unanticipated uh, reverberations. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can uh, I can see that. I, I think there are several questions coming in. Um, and before we dive into this idea of whether we are able to unlearn race, um, maybe another question that leading up to that would be: Does the idea of letting of letting go of the notion of race not still enable racism, or as somebody else puts it from the questions from the audience, how do we overcome racism from the perspective of, of moving away from race? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's the most important question. I think that you can't, in the, in the book, I tried to talk about a white cousin that I have, who um, she wants to use the language of Martin Luther King very glibly and very superficially to basically say, oh, I don't look at race, I don't pay attention to those differences. I, she didn't want to think very hard about why a black man might be shot by police, uh, be more likely to be shot by police than, than a white man. So she just said, I just judge people by their actions and what they do. This wasn't her trying to transcend racial difference. This was her actually just basically showing that she didn't want to think very hard about how racism can operate in our society and how certain people can be made to be black and made to be white. So what I'm arguing for is not that we um, don't pay attention to racism. I really am arguing for the opposite. I think we have to think, we have to all, we have to pay a lot of attention, study, be very serious about the ways in which racism functions and the way that it functions beyond uh, interpersonal interactions, the way that it functions, it does function. Um, systematically in, in, in ways that I think we have to be very careful um, to articulate and to and to not um, to not downplay 
with that mm-hmm. said, that can never be enough. So I'm saying we, we have to focus on the racism, but we have to actually say what is the end goal? What is the ultimate society we're trying to achieve? What does that society look like? For me, that society would look more like the rhetoric that you get in a society like France, where they don't use the language of race. I mean, France isn't a perfect society, and it's not applied perfectly. But the, I, the, the idea of the society they're trying to have is that we are all French citizens, and these, these ethnic groups, these differences, these religious differences, these color differences, this is not meaningful. We're all equal citizens. And the values that our republic espouses are universal values that can apply and can be upheld by everyone. I have to say that that's the way that I think the society of the future that would actually be the one that I'm trying to achieve, that's how it would look. It wouldn't look like a society in which we are all... Um, equal in our separation from each other with separate values and separate, separate um, uh, ideals uh, and separate, separate ways of being treated uh, among ourselves, which is, which is the way that the American discourse is trending now. And I, th- I think it's, in some ways it's quite depressing. We're farther away from the kind of society, the mountaintop that Martin Luther King articulated in the 1960s in many ways, that rhetoric has started to seem naive to people. And so you have many people on the left arguing that they don't even want to get to the society that Dr. King articulated. They want to be in a society where people are essentially understood to be different from each other and that you can never understand my experience if you haven't lived my same identity group. That's it. That's it. That's that's a possible future. I'm not saying that my ideas and, and, and my goals for society are inevitable, but I'm saying that that's not a future that I would um, wish to live in or wish to achieve. Mm-hmm. Rona, you want to follow up on that? Short, short. I, I think so many things are, are being said that um, that I would love to just touch on everyone, but I can't. Um, I, First, I think I really do endorse your plea, um, um, Thomas, and, and to invalidate y- your call. And, and I see it to a certain extent. I may even say, though, that you may be ahead of times in the, set, in the sense of can it be achievable, you know, and is it achieved right now? Um, and you talked about universalism versus individualism. At an individual plane, it, it, it might be something that one can do or, 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 or um, put forward. But unless those systemic um, those systems that 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 we are confronted by and that we we live by and um, are governed by um, are removed, then to a certain extent it it, it cannot happen. And um, so so that that's one point. And then another thing you touched on was lived experience, and I think that's also something that I can say. So. It, it varies from one individual to the next. So, for example, if you look at your social location and your lived experience, you might be more predisposed to be able to 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 move away from or make that call by virtue of where you're located, by virtue you you talked you touched on race, class, by virtue of the level of education that you have, the um, academic upbringing that you came with, the social circles in which you move. Um, so, the everyday um, black person. Um, who, for example, you said you were never um, pulled over by the police. Um, the ev- that's the everyday black person, for example, lives uh, in, in, in a perpetual nightmare that that may happen to them. So the reality is certainly certainly different, you know. So and, and I like where the conversation is going in the sense that yes, I I, I respect the plea and I validate it. Um, how how can the systems that be? Um, you know, change it. And one of the questions that you that that you that you um, proposed, Tide, was said that how why is it that we still continue to to speak of race, even though we want to um, change it or end it? And and that's also the d- dilemma. I, I think that Thomas also speaks to that 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 we we try to get rid of something that's there that has been superimposed. You know, if you take of linear linear and then the various classification, you know, the student is botanist in terms of the various dynamics, and that that created the spin off into so many um, hierarchies and notion of superior and inferior that we are living with today. So it's not as easy, um, you know, as it sounds. So I totally relate to a lot of the the, um, feedback you may have gotten, Thomas, a lot of the the dissenting views that you would have gotten. And I can also see that happening, for example, with respect to Black Lives Matter. And this is also a dilemma for me because I think for the first time in history, we are witnessing a global solidarity of such magnitude 
based on, I think, a full understanding, or a, I wouldn't even say full, but a, a, an understanding that is more full in terms of what is blackness and the black struggle in America. And I think now some of the resistance that you may get is based on that. If it is that at a time where our identity is being understood in terms of the element of blackness, not a color, um, that is bringing such movement for change, is it the time for us to be trying to um, dismantle that identity? Yeah, and, and I, I understand what you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's a couple of things. I certainly agree with many of the aims of Black Lives Matter. For example, um, I haven't been pulled over by the police, but in my first book I write, about, you know, my brother being the victim of police brutality and, and, you know, I can't prove it, but I'm certain that that was influenced by his racial identity. I don't mean to uh, give the impression that there's not um, racialized uh, abuse that black people, you know, suffer, that many black people can suffer, especially when, when, when race intersects with poverty in America. Um, absolutely, I, I, I share the goals of making um, our society, one in which um, fewer people are shot or, or brutalized by police. I think that it's still a short-term victory to put that in terms of racial identity, as opposed to saying, if you look at the numbers, at the statistics, you, black people make up 13 million, um, 13% of, uh, of 320 million Americans. Um, they get disproportionately uh, killed by police. About 250 black people a year get killed by police. Um, 1,000 Americans a year get killed by police, 500 of which are white. Um, that's a smaller proportion of the white population, but I think that we should all be concerned about, for example, too many Americans being killed by an, a hyper-militarized police force in America. And we should make the case that Americans should not be killed by American police. This is an issue that affects blacks, but it affects us all, in fact. And so this is, this is I think that the, 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 the real victory would not be simply to, to, to gain sympathy for the black experience, but to, 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 again, have universal values. The police shouldn't be killing citizens, or non-citizens for that matter. Um, and, and that's the value we all are going to, to collectively um, buy into the idea making it making an issue that 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 somehow is special um for blacks both makes white people think that it's not something that necessarily affects them and so then you're playing on you need to have their sympathy you need to have their attention in something that they don't think is their own but it also it's fundamentally untrue you know george floyd i cried when i saw that video and it shocked me but two years before george floyd you can find a video in which Several police officers are kneeling on the chest of a handcuffed white man named Tony Timpa, and they're laughing, and, and he says, I can't breathe, and he dies. It's on video. It, it never really struck the public imagination, for whatever the reason. Um, there's a history of black people being killed by police, and there's, a, there's, there's, there's an image that George Floyd's death um, holds in our imagination that's horrific. But for any of these deaths, you can find a video, not just a story of this happening, you can find a video of it happening to a white person. And so it makes me think that we may be obscuring things. The racial element may obscure more than it illuminates. Because the other thing about George Floyd, I, I, and this is what I was trying to get at before, the other thing about George Floyd is that he wasn't just a black man. Um, he was a poor black man. He, was, uh, he had recently survived COVID. He was out of work, like 40 million Americans at that time were also out of work. And he was in a desperate enough situation that the encounter with the police was, was initiated by his having passed a counterfeit banknote in a store. He didn't have cash on him. So I think that the idea that all of what happened to George Floyd is racialized, misses uh, an enormous amount of what's going on, which is that um, we have horrific class inequality as well that often intersects with race, but is not simply reducible to race. And so one of the things that I have really realized since the publication of this book or since the writing was complete with this book 
if I could rewrite the book, I would, I would add a section on this. I really think that some form of reparations based on the historical oppression uh, and exploitation of a certain group of people deemed black in America, reparations for this exploitation, not just of slavery, but for the hundred years after slavery in which people were denied housing opportunities, which people were denied chances to have wealth, some form of material reparation would go a lot would go a ways towards addressing some of the racial problems that we have. And it would be a class-based um, way of addressing the fact that black people tend to disproportionately be poor. So I, I think that one of the things that really has to be taken seriously is that it, it, it can't just be that we're against racism, but we do need material solutions to some of these problems. The, the police kill poor people, that's the, that's the fact. They kill poor people, black, white, Latino, Native American, hardly ever Asian. They kill poor people much more than they kill upper middle class college educated people. That's that's one of the most important differences. Um, sorry to follow up on that. So, sorry, there's something going wrong with my. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about this. <laughs> to follow up on that, I think there's a question that that touches upon this as well. For uh, if you put forth that race obscures, for instance class differences, there's a person she said, he or she says, this person says, um, given Isabel Wil Wilkerson's book, Caste, The Lies That Divide Us, would you agree that casteism, if I pronounce it right, might be a good term to replace racism as it highlights systemic power differences and rather than or not race or color? Um. I have thought a lot about Wilkerson's book. I haven't read it yet, but I've read the excerpt that was published uh, in the New York Times, and I've read some reviews, and I've followed the conversation around it. And her premise seems both compelling and not quite fully um, able to explain the complexity of, uh, of American society. Um, leaving aside the comparison to Nazi Germany as one of the three um, really like uh, one of the three caste systems that she looks at, uh, the other being um, in India. Um, when you look at um, what she's calling caste in America, it's, it's difficult for me to... It's difficult for me to accept that that can be a solid caste system like what happens with untouchables in India when you have Barack Obama, but you have the highly visible black success stories, but you have an enormous amount of, um, at this point, of black professionals and middle class blacks and, and, and people that are very difficult to fit into boxes. There's a lot of ambiguity in American society and in the kind of life experiences that... Um, are not neatly, so much of American life doesn't neatly add up in the ways that um, making it seem as though all members of what's called white are able to slot into a caste that is, that is accorded more respect than all members who are deemed to be black. I think that there's a lot to her point, but I, I, but I, I'm not sure if the exceptions that I'm, that, that I'm kind of fixated on are mere um, ways of testing the rule instead of are actually um, are, are, are worth dwelling on in themselves. I think when I've spoken about the book with with friends who have grown up in India, their their impressions seem to be that um, it's, it's it's very difficult to make the comparison between American society and Indian society. So we're gradually moving into the Q and A session already, I think. So um, just to encourage you, people watching at home, um, you can still put forth questions. The Mentimeter code is four six six seven eight six four. That is four six six seven eight six four. So, um, oh yeah, let's just pick another question. Um, Thomas, the question is: Would you say that rather than dismissing race? It's more about always talking about its intersectionality, like render the issues complex as they are instead of highlighting only one aspect of it. Well, I do think that intersection, like an, an, an intersectional framework um, is always better than a kind of overly simplistic uh, 
single lens approach to understanding a person or a group's life experiences. Absolutely. The problem is that um, a country and a culture is not a graduate program. So a lot of people don't bring that kind of sophistication to their interactions. And so I think that we need to find a way of speaking about um, our society that doesn't require everybody to have had a um, a certain kind of advanced uh, elite uh, university education. What does that mean in practice? I'm not sure, but I, 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 it's very difficult for me to believe the solution can be that everybody has to kind of understand um, critical theories and critical studies, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm just going through. Do yeah, you Lorna. Yeah. Yeah. So, um um, Thomas, I can't let you leave without asking, without talking about Genevieve. <laughs> about without, what? without talking, asking you about Genevieve and Val Valentine's grandmother and her ah. souvenir on, on, on the coffee table. <laughs> and I, I bring that in because currently in in, the, in Dutch context, and you know, there is a lot of conversation around Black Pete. So I think mm -hmm. they can relate to this question a little bit. Um, you know, you describe the souvenir as an astonishing thick lip bug-eyed porcelain head of a slave or servant woman, and you mentioned that it posed an existential problem for you, and it would certainly pose an existential one for me as well, trust me. But then, to me, you sort of explained away the microaggression to yourself, you know, and um, I, I, again, I have, you know, I've complained at length to her, this is, this is your wife, Valentine, yet the bizarre thing is that the more I complain, the more I realize that I am also playing a role willing myself even into some strange communion with an anger that exists outside of me, an anger that has never rightfully been my own. The lived experience behind the anger belongs to someone else, to a memory. My wife and I continue to argue and then we begin to laugh at my torment because the grievance remains too abstract, too artificial. So for me, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that um, you, it, it caused an existential problem for you. Uh, it is indeed was a microaggression, uh, microaggression. And in a way, you sort of um, rationalize it away. And, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, trans, transgenerational, um, intergenerational trauma, we talk about um, racism not being something that's historic, but also contemporary. And, and I think to a certain extent, I'm not too sure that it's not something that you can not own or, or even for me, you know, um, um, that, that we can... To a certain extent, it also belongs to us. That existential um, glitch that it caused. What, what What do you think? That's a interesting comparison that I hadn't immediately thought of. But Black Pete, I actually do think um, should be criticized a lot. I I I, I tend to fall into the kind of category of people that doesn't really feel comfortable with banning things. Um, so, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, very offensive cartoons in France or, or what have you, or Black Pete, I'm not sure that what needs to happen is the government bans this. But I do think that there should be um, a lot of pushback. And I certainly find Black Pete extraordinarily um, bothersome, um, uncomfortable. I can see that if I were living in Dutch society, I would not really like Black feet. And the truth is, there's a kind of figure like that in most European um, cultures. It's not just the Netherlands. Um, I hate it. Um, and I think that I, I really sympathize with and, and, and echo the sentiments of people who are criticizing it. Um, in the case of this kind of private setting uh, in my wife's grandmother's house with this porcelain figure that I found so distasteful, um, the question I was trying to pose, I wasn't trying to be glibly dismissive, but the question I was trying to pose was, what does it mean to be strong enough so that um, certain kinds of offense don't destabilize you? Or so you, you take a broader picture, you know, um, what am I trying to achieve, I guess, is the question I always ask. And, and, and is it a society on which we live on equal terms? Is it a family in which I live on equal terms? Am I in a multiracial context within which I'm already respected and valued? In many ways, I felt that I was. And so, you know, this kind of provocation I felt was a provocation. It was unintentional, but it was it was also one that was minor. And I felt that my sense of myself was not um, at stake 
I know who I was. I know what my ancestry is. I know what we overcame and I know what I've achieved and I know where I am in American and French society. And this statue doesn't have the power to, um, to harm me. And then I tried, you know, I tried to explain just that I think it's a losing battle to think that you can kind of educate everybody outside of certain mistakes because the way that she grew up, her age, where she is uh, in relation to these questions, she may actually not be able to see, she may not actually be able to understand um, what's going on from, from the perspective that I'm understanding it. And so that's something that I think is a controversial thing to say, but I guess I'll say it. I think you have to be pragmatic about what you get out of challenging every racial provocation and, and, and what's the, like, the bigger picture goal of making a society work together. Uh, and so I, I don't know that every single call out is actually productive. And that gets back to what we were talking about before when um, sometimes emphasizing the racial dynamics and the microaggressions in every situation can actually lead to a counterproductive productive kind of situation. So it's, it's a question that I was really wrestling with uh, for years in my own family. But ultimately, I said, you know, it, for me, the solution was that the question doesn't really, um, it doesn't matter that much to me, I guess. And were she actually disrespectful to me personally, then it would matter to me in a different way. But it was one of those things where I realized that I could kind of, um, I guess I would say it's something like what one of these uh, French imams whose name I'm, I'm blanking on said. He said, you know, I hate these cartoons in Charlie Hebdo, but my faith is strong enough that that can't harm, that can't harm my faith. Yeah, I, I really respect that answer. Thank you. There are a lot of questions uh, pouring in already. Um, I think there's one, and I, I would be curious to know what you both think of it, uh, in fact. So one of the questions is, uh, how do you look at colorism? And how do you see the privilege of mixed people over people with a darker skin for who it might be easier to move away from the notion of race? So, uh, Thomas, I think I pose it uh, first to you. But then, Rona, I'm also curious what you think about this. Sure. Well, I was going to say I'd love to hear. Rona comes from uh, coming from Trinidad. That's a society. Those Caribbean societies have more um, potentially have more colorism uh, in the culture than even in America. So I'd love to hear Rona first, if you don't mind. No, I don't. No. Rona. Well, that's that's fine, Thomas. Thank you. And you're so right. I think colorism is as much a part of um, the conversation and the dynamic as racism is. And um, to negate it, it's 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 the same conversation we're having um, tied, and um, that it's not as easy to negate. And certainly, it does um, have the the layers and the hierarchy where one is respected over the other in the same in the same way that whiteness is elevated and blackness is is de is not elevated or it's 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 there in terms of the status. Um, the notions of color, where where light lighter skinned or darker skin. Um, is something that that that's real. You know, if you define something as real and it's real in, in their consequences, it, it's very real. So um, it it will take a lot of um, mindset changing, a lot of um, awareness raising, a lot of education to break to break out of those barriers. And I think for myself, also growing up in 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 a Caribbean dynamic, in a Hindu household. Um, with um, siblings who were differently colored, it was quite interesting for me because I also experienced it because I was the darker of my siblings. And I actually, I, I had to sort of set myself free from, from those dynamics. And uh, I remember reading James Joy's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. It's interesting that your book is also called Self-Portrait of Black and White Thomas. But Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, and basically it says that... Um, you talk to me of language, nationality, religion, and I will fly by those nets. And I think that's essentially what I did. I went to, a, you know, I, I was immersed in a Hindu household, but ex lived in a street that was very multicultural. I went to school in a Catholic dynamic. Um, so I had all the sort of um, intersectional, the, all the elements that sort of allowed me those intersectionality that we're talking about, those different lens that enabled me to say, yeah, I can free myself from these societal nets and I will not be bound by what society dictates um, I, I should abide by. 
So, and, and that's, but it's not denying it because it exists, but it's a matter how we navigate the waters. So similar to what I think Thomas is doing, I sort of did with respect to, to colorism. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I, I, I assumed that you were from a Hindu background, but it's interesting. You have the double experience because colorism is in Indian society and in Caribbean society. That's right. Um, uh, you know, I think about this a lot. One of the first things um, a black American French friend said to me when he first saw a picture of my daughter was he said, wow, that's what, you know, you know, in Martinique, they have 30, I believe it's 36 um, different terms for, for every different shade. Of, of of person who's not white, and he said your daughter would have been what they call in Martinique chape, which is which is a kind of way of saying échappé, which is a way of saying escaped. And and I thought about that so many times that if you were technically black, but if you had a drop of black blood, but essentially looked white, they called you escaped. And you know this was not white people calling you that. This was this was other black people calling you that. And this is something that I, it's, it's very difficult to, a lot of white people I don't think have ever paused to think about this, but it's something that I, every black person I know um, certainly is aware of. And it's something that's really profoundly harmful. Um, the, the, the elevation of whiteness and lightness within non-white groups, self-conception is something that white people can't fix that for for non-whites. That's something that really has to be reckoned with um, uh, on its own. And and I think it's one of the things that, um, yeah, it's one of the things that makes me the saddest. You know, in the book I write about uh, when my mother told me, you know, that my father's aunt when he was growing up, you know, my father's brown-skinned, when his aunt, and his aunt certainly was too, told him that he was not, he was expected not to bring around any girls who were darker than he was and you know it's just, there's just something so profoundly heartbreaking about that um and of course that's related to you know narratives of white supremacy that have always been you know emphasized uh, over the centuries but that's something that uh that's something distinct from racism it's something that really um can only be worked out uh within the communities themselves ourselves there um, are several questions regarding whiteness so i'm going to try to blend a couple of them together um so one of the questions is in how far how far do you think white privilege is a reality and if so how far do you believe it extends um, so yeah i think about this a lot because It's something that you have to get correct when you talk about. Is there something that loosely correlates to this concept of white privilege that, that is undeniably real in society? Sure. Um, walking through a store and being expected not to be um, up to no good or stealing something, you know, that's something that white people can take for granted. And black people can be racially profiled. Lots of things um, like that operate in society. But I also think that it kind of um, is a way of not sitting with and really thinking through and dealing with the complexity of, of, of life in the 21st century. And I think that in some ways I've had um, a privilege of my own, which is a kind of um, um, a privilege of perspective, being in a family where um, there, are, there, there are white family members and black family members. and. Um, the black family members uh, attained higher levels of education and financial success. And so when I really think of something like white privilege, I understand that it means that within the larger society, there are ways of seeing and ways of valuing whiteness that supposedly benefit some of my cousins. But I have every privilege imaginable, basically, except for society saying blackness is better than whiteness. Uh, going for me um, in contrast to, to my cousins and my aunt and my uncle. And when I'm around them, I don't feel in any way um, um, oppressed. And, 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 and so I think that something like that really dismisses the extent to which individual lives are very different. My, my white family members are actually, you know, these are people who, who can 
struggle in in 21st century knowledge economy. These are people who don't travel around the world and who've never been to Europe, don't have passports. Um, it's whether there is a privilege or not. I also wonder how productive it is to dwell in it because it's very difficult to get an uneducated poor white person whose economic security has been shattered and doesn't really see how their children will possibly have um, a better life than their own. It's very difficult to get them to see how they're privileged, whether or not they are. I, and so again, it brings me back to thinking, are there ways that we can talk about um, universal values and universal goals about a society we're trying to achieve that doesn't ground it in identity and put people on the defensive? And also, I think it's just, you know, there's something that I just resist about saying that they have some type of privilege over me. And I don't mean to always make it personal, but I know quite a lot of black people who are thriving and flourishing. And so it's, it's difficult for me to use blanket terms like this because I think that they, they gloss over a lot of what can be so surprising about, um, about uh, American life. And uh, Rona, how do you view this? I think the nuances that um, Thomas bring out are very, um, very true and very clear. Um, I also think one way to measure it would be if we have the um, the equalizers. So, for example, all the all the variables being constant, and you have a group of persons who are constant in terms of um, socioeconomic status, in terms of class, in terms of education, and the only differentiation differentiating variable is the element of whiteness. I think then you can look and and truly test to say, yeah. Um, then the notion of white privilege in terms of differential treatment to each of those groups um, is there. So that being said, when you look at those groups where you do have those similarities and the differentiating indicator is the element of whiteness, to that extent, um, I think so they, they, they do stand to be um, privileged um, in terms of access and, um, to, to, to certain opportunities. Mm. I think we gradually have to move on to final questions already. It's going really, really fast. Um, so one of the things uh, I was wondering, so if transcending race is indeed possible and desirable, who can foster this change and how? I think this is a question I can pose to you, uh, to you both. So maybe, Rana, you're working at our university, uh, also uh, drawing upon issues such as race, discrimination. Uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think um, this is just this is one example of, of a way that to do that, um, Tide. I think it's about, as Thomas said, um, being have, being free to differ and um, being able to respect different opinions. We are a university, which is the you know the, the seat of um, of debate, the seat of um, of questioning uh, um, scientific knowledge. That that's where these discussions um, ought to happen. You know, um, one of the things as an equity strategist, um, I, I, I said, let's engage in courageous conversations. And it is for this very reason. So the only way that we can debunk it or make change is by confronting it. And if it means calling calling it um, black or white or, or whatever we do is to have these debates, have these discussions. And, um, you know, and from from these policies arise from 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 these discussions, um, they can be actionized. You know, for example, on campus, I know now we have we had a group of students who who have um, held us accountable and insisted that we do have um, cre the creation of safe space where pe persons of color can um, can have some conversation around race. That has been created. We have now created a student, um, an, uh, um, you know, anti-racism student network. We are looking at having um, anti-racism week in March of next year. So it's really about saying, hey, this conversation is happening. How do we not? Just, just turn away from it? How do we confront it? How do we embrace it? And how do we grow from it? Thomas? Yeah, I really agree. Um, the first thing that people have to do is to be able to speak openly and freely, like uh, like Runa said, and, and, and to actually um, have confidence that um, they can be heard and, you know, any climate in which people are afraid to say what they really think is one which ultimately um, doesn't serve us well, which is part of the problem you see politically when um, the polls keep um, turning up wrong and we don't know um, which candidate is actually um, supported in which groups the way they are because people don't say what they actually think. We need free speech and we need the free exchange of ideas because we don't know what we don't know and we don't know what we'll hear that will actually help us. 
Um, so I, th- I, I, I 100% agree that it starts with, with, with talking and listening. Um, and then I think it really starts, to be honest, it really starts with white people. And, and this is where I'm very hopeful. I don't think there has ever been a time in my life when so many white people were genuinely uh, grappling with and trying to understand uh, or trying to at least appear to understand questions of racism in society and inequality and oppression and, and, and trying to understand what it means to be black, what it means to, you know, to, to be Muslim. Uh, these, these questions are, are with us now in a way that I think is, is, is difficult and is causing a lot of kind of discomfort, but is ultimately really, really um, hopeful. Um, and so I think that, you know, white people are going to have to grapple with race and going to have to grapple with what the construction of whiteness has done and what it means. And not just to feel guilty about it or to apologize for their whiteness or to make gestures at uplifting um, token minorities, but to actually think, I, I argue they're going to have to actually think very seriously about what it would mean to move beyond whiteness and to stop being white and what it would mean in terms of creating a society in which people didn't, what James Baldwin said, you know, I'm not an N-word, uh, you somehow felt a need to make me that, and you're going to have to think about why it is that you needed that, and you're going to have to think about what your life would be like. Uh, were there no more racial oppositions? Was, was there no um, blackness to depose whiteness with? Um, and so I really think it starts from there. But like, like we said before, I think that you know everybody kind of needs to put the sort of identity down so that it becomes feasible. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And I think it's about doing it together. And I, I, that's why I respect your stance, Thomas, because you cannot put mainstream culture, uh, uh, you know, um, you cannot peg one against the other. And right. the element of diversity, equity, inclusion involves all of us. It's not it's not minority group with mainstream at the side. But in exactly. fact, we are, exactly. yeah, re- realizing that we are all part of the dynamic. Yes. I'm... Uh Really, really sorry that we have to bring it to a close, but Rona, I want to give you the opportunity to to pose one final question, maybe before we definitely wrap up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, you know, Thomas, it was a pleasure for me to sit in this space with you and to be and to have walked through the, your words um, in your in your books. Um, for me, it was a great honor. Um, I think, um, and I, I think I speak also for Tide. Um, for me would be if you have to summarize the essence of what you um, of what you said in, in your text in a few words and a few sentences, I'll give you that opportunity to do oh. so. Well, thank you. It was really a pleasure to speak with you both and to have a chance to um, to speak to, to some, some Dutch students. This is the first time I've had the chance to do that. So thank you. Um, thank you for everybody uh, tuning in. Um, what I was trying to say in the book was that... Um, the way that we're not going to transcend racism so long as we believe in race and the way that I was able to move beyond some of the questions and thought structures that had kind of haunted me my whole life was to stop interacting with um, avatars of whiteness or blackness, uh, representatives of groups, and, and, and to really begin interacting with and seeing and, 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 and seeing the individual in the interaction. I don't have a white daughter, a white wife, a black dad. I have a father, I have a daughter, I have a wife. And, and th- these people are, are are irreducible to these abstractions that um, had governed the way that I had been thinking about things in the past. And so I think to really attempt to see people and interact with people as themselves and to not allow the, the veil of, of, of race, the veil of alterity, um, to project myths and conflicts and prejudices of times past onto the person. I think this is the way forward. We have to really make the effort not to get blinded by, by, by the veil of race, by the veil of otherness. Thank you, Thomas. And so I want to thank you both for, for being here tonight. I, I thought it was really I really enjoyed the conversation. I think we we touched on many, many things. And I hope that when this pandemic has uh, cooled down a bit, we can continue the conversation and further reflect on the meaning of race, of whiteness, 
and maybe indeed find ways to move beyond this. So Thomas, thank you very much for, for joining us. Rona, also thank you very much for being here. Um, mm. I think uh, this is it. So I'm going to the people watching at home also thank you for being here. Um, and know that tomorrow there's another live stream. It's in Dutch, so I will... Uh, also switch to Dutch. Dus morgen is er weer een, uh, een live lezing van Radboud Effect. Uh, dit keer is het thema God en de stad, zorg voor de ander. Dat gaan we in gesprek met humanismekenner Niels de Nutte, theoloog Janneke Stegeman en religiewetenschapper Paul van der Velden. Het belooft een interessante avond te worden, dus tune in en ik hoop u dan weer te zien. For now, thanks for watching, have a very nice evening and until next time.